Uh, thank you all for introducing yourselves. Uh, my name is Michael Marcos. Uh, right now, I'm a director of engineering at a company called Live Intent. Uh, if you ever see an ad in an email, you can blame me. Um, I right now have a team of about 15 engineers. I've been making dumb things with code for about 20 years and doing so for money for about 12 years. Uh, I've been working remotely since 2012, uh, so long before COVID, and people realized the actual value in working remotely. I used to have a mustache. I wish I still did. Uh, I like way too many things. I hate mowing lawns, and I have a son who is, without bias, the coolest in the world, and there is proof. <laughs> so starting with my history, I was a precocious child. We're not going to go that far back. Um, but I'm going to start uh, with where I was at in high school. <clears throat> High school is, for me, and probably most people, where I started figuring out the things that I liked, that I didn't like, that I was good at, that I was bad at. Um, and one of the things that I started to learn to like was programming. <clears throat> Got a little bit involved with PHP. I also liked uh, subverting authority a little bit. So when my high school banned the AOL Instant Messenger protocol, which is a very old sentence to say, um, uh, me and a friend worked on an app to enable all our friends to chat together. Uh, could do all the things that AOL Instant Messenger, again, very old, uh, could do, like changing your font color. That's it. Um, but it was a fun learning experience, and I got to kind of stick it to the high school admins, which was a lot of fun. <clears throat> uh, it's also where I learned uh, the things that I wasn't good at. Um, I was involved in our uh, our daily uh, video news program, uh, BCTV. Uh, after weeks and weeks and weeks of begging the uh, teacher that was running the program to get in front of camera, I was finally allowed to. I thought my great idea, my breakout hit idea, was going to be to take the mouse that we left on the table, right in frame, incredibly unprofessional. We were going to take it and put it on the floor, click it with our feet. It's my very first day in front of a camera, uh, put it on the floor. Big smile, lights on, uh, I right-clicked, I clicked again, I exited the presentation. Instead of failing forward like you're supposed to do, I laughed and ran off camera. <clears throat> I'm not very good with pressure. I wasn't invited to anchor ever again also. Um, but it's also where I learned uh, that I don't do the things that I don't like to do. Uh, which wasn't particularly good. I listened to my parents, uh, and I took AP Calc BC instead of honors programming for those college credits. Those pre-college college credits are very important. Came time for the AP exam, I got a one or a five, whichever was the bad one, the really, really bad one. I forget at this point. Um, but it taught me something about myself at the time. And uh, then I went to college. Part one, the bad part. I had no discipline when I first went to school. <clears throat> I didn't know what I wanted to do uh, professionally, at school, academically. Um, I just had kind of broad ideas, and I wanted to mess around. Newfound freedom was really, really bad for me. Um, <clears throat> my grades were really reflective of this. At the time, I was very lucky. Uh, my parents were willing and able to pay for my education, but after the first year, very understandably, that situation changed. So I was given an option I could take out loans for 60000 a semester um, or go to a school that costs less. And at the time, it was just going with the flow, and I decided to take the latter option. So we started looking around, and then came college years part two, which was Dr. Deb, Fred, and Dr. Pezlak dragging me to the finish line. The first day that I walked into Penn State uh, Worthington Scranton, which is now, I guess, Penn State Scranton, um, I walked into... I honestly don't remember what building, but I do remember walking into Doc Deb, who turned around and said, Hi, I'm Doc Deb. I teach here. I love this stuff. I'm really excited to have you here. And I was like, okay, okay, okay. A little, little too much. Um, but I went home that night, and I just remember thinking, I've never really met anyone with that type of passion, that kind of excitement for much of anything. Um, and I wound up uh, uh, coming here. Uh, I spent uh, the rest of my five-year college tenure here. Um, I had a lot of fun memories. Our IST 110 video, which I have screenshots of, not the whole video. Uh, shopping cart project in JSP, finite state automata, the AT our ATM proposal, which if you've ever seen the like get $100 cash thing, that wasn't big banks that did that. That was us, our team. We should get credit for that. 
Uh, I had a research project uh, where I worked on a tic-tac-toe game uh, where clients could connect to a server and uh, effectively play tic-tac-toe over a network. Uh, a lot of this stuff seems kind of like basic these days, but back then it was kind of cool. Um, and it was also absolutely terribly designed. I was sending game state as like a string from one client to another, and frankly, that's probably how most multiplayer games work anyway, so maybe it wasn't that bad. Um, I really started learning about databases. That's something that I didn't really know back then. That AIM subversion app that I made was writing everything to flat files. And uh, for anybody that's in IST or IT, you know how terrible that actually sounds. Um, random little moments uh, here. Uh, I was at an internship where I started getting back into PHP. Again, for the IST or IT or... Um, any sort of development majors, uh, you might be familiar with this, but if you want a for loop, you've got your initializer, for int i, equals zero, then your uh, exit condition, then your iterator, and it's really ugly and messy, and just learn about this thing called for each, where you pass in the array, and then as the element, and then it's easy, and you don't have any iterators messing up your code. Um, went to Italy. I don't know if anybody else has been told on international trips that if you smash apples into Windows, you'll have to go home. Um, I don't know if Dr. Pezlak has had to cross that bridge with any other group since. I hope not. Um, and ra- <laughs> I hope that wasn't something worse. No, we, um, we're going to PAX. Oh. Friday. Oh, yeah. cool. So I hope he's I didn't. Like, he's like, that's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope I didn't give. I'm so sorry, Dr. Pezlak. He gives such good ideas. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, but I learned things that I, I otherwise probably wouldn't have liked. Um, the Architecture of Language is a random takeaway. Uh, I still have that book. Uh, it's really weird poems, but they're fun and nice and relaxing. I enjoy reading about the Vichyssoise, which I still don't entirely know what that means. Uh, Invisible Cities, random books that, uh, while I was here, were uh, uh, in Ron Perone's classes. Um, I didn't really think I'd like that stuff, but just being around people that had passion for it and kind of listening to that and focusing in on that gave me a little bit of desire to get into it. Except for writing papers, I still hate that. It's terrible. I don't like writing anything more than I absolutely have to write. So this is our very modern, this is just screenshots of our very modern IST 110 video about an emerging technology called Bluetooth. You've all heard of it, I assume. Uh, as you can tell, this was made with Windows Movie Maker, which again, very high tech. But this project let me kind of experiment with like a little bit of creativity. Uh, I got to send my friend up into a tree, redid it in the style of the Troy McClure Simpsons videos, like, hi, I'm Troy McClure. You might have seen me from other videos such as throw the baby out with the bathwater, uh, random uh, Simpson episodes, uh, where he uh, told his young companion uh, that he was going to show him all about Bluetooth technology. They broke into my apartment, tied me up with ethernet cable, uh, and then demonstrated a whole bunch of Bluetooth devices around. I eventually broke free of my shackles and chased them out of the apartment. Um, But it it started to kind of give me uh, something that I I didn't have before. Um, And I I do certainly credit IST for that uh, and Penn State and all the wonderful teachers here. Uh, Near the end of my time here uh, at Penn State, I got an internship uh, and I started a company with a friend, which I will call the semi-professional years. Uh, This is Eat, Mix, and Brave Gamer. Uh, Eat Mix was my first internship that was lined up by the resources here. Um, it was a social network uh, designed for people who wanted to meet other people at restaurants. You all have used it, right? No? No, Eat Mix isn't part of your daily lives? Oh, goodness. Uh, the, it, it obviously did not go anywhere, but it was a really fun learning experience. This is where I learned about For Each and my life forever changed, and I got a PHP tattoo because of it. Um, <laughs> I actually met uh, a, a longtime friend uh, at this internship. Uh, we wound up founding Brave Gamer together. Uh, the goal at that point in time, uh, it was accessible to get into web development. Everything that you could do, most of the stuff that we did was self-taught, um, but it wasn't as accessible as it is today. Uh, so what we wanted to do was effectively create a service that would enable anybody that wanted to create text-based online games uh, to do so. Providing services like being able to exchange real money for in-game currency, facilitating trades, interactions with other games, um, stuff like that. It was, again, a really fun learning experience. Uh, We entered the GVTA business plan competition. We got second place, a little bit of seed fund, pretty much just enough to get ourselves laptops and uh, six months or 12 months time in the incubator in Scranton. A really fun period of my life where I got to learn a ton. 
Uh, but this was near the end of my college experience. Uh, and this was when I was looking for a job that paid money. That was number one priority. And uh, an internship and a startup that uh, was, uh, if there's a word pre, pre-revenue, that's where we were at, uh, wasn't quite uh, the ticket. So I entered the professional years, part one. I hated it. I moved to Philly. I worked for a company called Deloitte. Uh, I started at a group called the Tax Management Advisory Services, which is exactly as exciting as it sounds. Uh, the group was relatively new for the company. Uh, they didn't have a ton of work that was relevant to our field, which was effectively using technology to enable better business processes and uh, lots more uh, business jargon. Uh, I spent most of my days being billed out for stupid amounts of money that I didn't see to open a folder, look at a checklist, make sure that the forms are filled out, close the folder, put it on a pile, and do that five million times throughout the course of the week. Um, near the end of my time there, uh, I saw that the senior on the project was doing something every single morning, took her at least an hour every single morning. I was like, I can make that better. I can make that pretty much a push button. I can do like, I can write a VBA macro for you. It'll, it'll fix everything. And I, I asked her if I could spend like a day just working on this. Um, and she had to make a, a very real decision at the time, which was, do I give up thousands of dollars of billing to let this kid, who I don't know if he can do this thing, fix my workflow? Um, I did it. I, it was this weird dichotomy of emotions, because when I, when I showed her what I had done, I was crestfallen. The highlight of the last eight months for me was working on a VBA macro, which is not a great place to be. Um, and I knew that time was over, this exciting one day that I had. Uh, but she was so thrilled. She was incredibly excited. And I think everybody here, regardless of whether or not you're in IT or IST or uh, nursing, psychology, any of the, the many majors uh, that are represented here, you understand that technology can help us. That's pretty intuitive these days. It wasn't as much back then. There was a very real business decision that had to be made as to whether or not lost billing hours was worth the time. Um, so after that uh, experience, realizing how much joy I could have um, if I did this on the regular, um, I decided to make a change. And very coincidentally, uh, the, the man that I was working with, uh, Brave Gamer and EatMix, um, again, the raving social network that exists to this day, uh, he called me up and he said he was at a startup and he needed help and he was interested if uh, he wanted to see if I was interested. I was very interested because I hated what I was doing. <clears throat> so I went to Wilkesbury. I interviewed with the CEO at Tai Tai. I had four star chicken drunken noodle. I cried for most of the interview, a good portion of it because of the food, another portion because I really wanted that job. Um, and I got it. So I worked. Uh, professional US, part two. I loved it. Uh, I worked at Refer Local. Um, at this point, uh, I was employee number three. I don't know if anybody has heard of this. Was, this was probably like around 10 years ago. Um, if you opened a newspaper back then, which again is a very old sentence, and I'm going to say a lot of them during this talk, uh, you might have seen like at the top, the Daily Deal. Um, it was a startup in every sense of the word. Uh, and when I, when I say that, I, I mean it. The, the vision of the company and the product changed from the three weeks that it took for me to interview and get the job. Uh, it started off as like a, some hyper-local way for users to be able to promote deals at um, various retail establishments and get credit for it and get paid for it. And then it just turned into a Groupon clone that got glommed onto uh, newspapers. A uh, little bit different. Uh, was very exciting. It was, at the time, pretty successful. Um, the contacts that the CEO had with a lot of the newspapers and radio stations and television uh, channels in the area were really, really helpful, and we started to take off. Um, near the end of my time there, I started to think about what I wanted. Um, I'd enjoyed a lot of the stuff that I was doing. I enjoyed like the, the startup feel. I enjoyed, like, all right, you, you have 13 hats in front of you. You need to just pick one, wear it, and do that thing for that day. Um, I really enjoyed that feeling. But I wanted to figure out how I was going to advance. And this is, a, this is a drawing that I did like near the end of that time, which is my rise to the CTO, which was going really well, going really well, going really well. And then my CEO was told, like, you're kind of sort of like a CTO. And I realized, like, nope, I'm never going to be CTO here. Um, and I left. I started looking around in the area. Um, at that point, I wasn't really finding anything. I didn't really know exactly how to search. 
And so my answer was just open it up. Uh, so I started looking for remote positions. Uh, I got in touch with a recruiter. Uh, he told me about a company in Lakewood, New Jersey, that was interested in hiring their first remote developer. They weren't sure if it was going to work out, but they wanted somebody to take this risk with them. I was like, that sounds fun. Let's do it. Um, I drove out there, interviewed, drove back, sounded like everything was good. And then I was told I needed to come in and meet the CEO. It's like, we, we're doing a remote job, right? Like, can we do this remotely? Like, nope, no, no. She loves seeing people in person. So I drove down for a five minute interview where I was lobbed an incredibly easy uh, database question. And I left kind of sort of like disillusioned about the fact that this company wasn't really ready for remote work. Um, but I still said yes. Um, I was excited about it. I was excited about the prospects. I was excited about what they were doing. Uh, it was an ed tech company. They were working on a literacy solution that had proven success with teaching kids in underprivileged and uh, undereducated communities uh, how to improve their, their literacy. Um, so I started and achieved 3,000. I was there for two years. Um, again, I was terrified when I started before I even walked in the door. And then I walked in the door the first day, and this is what the office was. This was my first remote job, taking a big leap. This is not the office that I interviewed in. Sorry, I'm pointing there. You all can see it there. That is a, a gym in a half-abandoned strip mall uh, with cubicles set up in it. This was my first cubicle at this company. Uh, it had a torn chair. It had very, very cracked floors. That is an IBM ThinkPad. Another really old thing to say. I know it's Lenovo now, but that is an actual IBM ThinkPad. This is the, the conference room. This isn't a conference room. This is an OSB paneled kill room. That's what this is. It was really, really concerning to me to walk into this on my first day. Um, fortunately, I was only there for two weeks. Uh, the company had sold their, they, they let their lease lapse on their old office, and we moved into a really, really wonderful space shortly after. But I was terrified. I had no idea what to expect. Uh, Couple that with the fact that they wanted me in Monday to Wednesday every week for six months, which again, wasn't really instilling confidence that they wanted remote work. Um, but it taught me something. Um, it taught me something that I've been able to use in the last 12 months, and that is the importance of relationships, particularly in remote work. Um, the people that I wound up working with there, I got to meet every single day, uh, every single week, Monday to Wednesday. I was face to face. I was developing rapport with them. Um, and for remote work, which is, again, now maybe a little bit more accepted and we understand it a little bit better, um, it was really hard back then. Uh, to be the only person calling in for pretty much every single meeting where everybody else was in a room together. You don't want to be that one voice on the phone that's three seconds behind the conversation saying, hey, wait, can you guys hold up and, and say that again? I didn't quite hear that. Um, but because I was able to develop that rapport with the people that I worked with, um, I was able to kind of make that remote situation work. Uh, but near the end of that, I was starting to get a little bit antsy for tech growth. I wanted to develop my skills. Um, for any of the people that have been in software development uh, before, have done anything with software development, their big product was a home-rolled PHP framework, which I have it tattooed on my arm, but that, that sentence sends chills down my back. It's terrifying. Um, and uh, I, I felt like I needed to, to get out and discover some sort of additional growth. Uh, so I left. I wound up going to a company called Sparks, uh, which eventually turned into DOS, which I called the place where I made silly cat websites load faster. Um, I lost all sense of purpose uh, in my job. Uh, I really, most of what I did was enabling people to generate listicles better. Uh, for anyone not familiar with the term, list, article, listicle. Um, it wasn't rewarding to me, uh, but I experienced a, a level of growth that I hadn't experienced at any other job before. For anybody that's been doing software development, uh, anybody that's used like Composer or Maven, any of like the build or dependency management tools, those were not givens back in the day. That was not an absolute guarantee. Your JavaScript files were probably just includes in the head. Uh, your PHP framework was more than likely going to be just copied into a vendor folder. There was no Composer widespread usage. Their NPM was just barely starting to gain traction. Um, any of the modern web uh, build tools, completely out of the question. Um, the closest thing at that point was like Gulp and Grunt, uh, which were really just build tools. Uh, uh, but all of those things existed at Sparts. I learned 
a ton there. And one of the first things that I learned in this job, my very first push to uh, production, my very first feature outside of like, the, okay, like add your name to the environment files, like, ah, oh, you made your first commit, um, was uh, adding a query to a sidebar, which I didn't think all the way through. That sidebar uh, was executed multiple times because of some sort of inefficiency. So it's like five times, then the site was hit by like 10,000 people per minute. Uh, so the database uh, load logs look something like this, and I'll do it in reverse. So it went straight up to 100, down to 50, back up to 100, and then the database died. And if you followed my finger, it's kind of like an M. They all thought I was trolling them, putting my initial in the logs. Um, but it's a mistake that I learned. We walked back from it. I fixed what I the mistake I'd made, and I did not. I, I've made that mistake in the past, uh, subsequently, but I did not make that mistake for a very long time after that. It was burned into my memory. Um, the expression uh, "move fast and break things" uh, famous, uh, but I, I think there's something that is implicit in that that's kind of missing in the actual expression, which is uh, "move fast, break things, uh, learn fast." Um, that's really important. Uh, and I had my fair share of breaking things and learning fast at Sparts. But near the end, I felt that, that kind of void of purpose. I didn't feel like I was contributing to the world. The silly cat websites were fun, but uh, they weren't particularly rewarding. Uh, at my former company, even though I felt like I was just a small cog in a much bigger machine, felt like my efforts were going towards something that was noble and good. Uh, this was a company. Uh, it was a very mature company. This was Pirate Day, I believe. Um, but yes, it, it was very fun, uh, but I, I definitely lacked that purpose. So I went back to Achieve. Um, getting back to the relationships that I'd forged, um, I called up my old EP. I asked her what the hiring situation was, um, and I got effectively fast-tracked back into that company. Um, the people that uh, I had formerly worked with were really excited to have me back. Uh, we had good rapport. We fell right back into a good groove of working together. I came in as a senior. Uh, my role was effectively joining teams that needed a little bit of help, either in just throughput or implementing best practices. Um, I subsequently uh, was promoted to a development manager there. I got a small team of three engineers. I got another team. And then some personnel changes opened up a director position. And that was the first time I was a director. I was doing that for about a year. Um, but at that company, everything was basically status quo. Um, wasn't a lot to really do to, to right the ship. Uh, we had a pretty clear product vision. Um, by and large, where I was at, uh, as far as steering the group, you know, I was just kind of like nudging the wheel a little bit here and there. And after a year, that started to kind of wear down on me a little bit. Um, and coupled with the fact that every level, uh, every step that you take in this particular uh, promotion path gets you a little bit further away from the things that you were tip, you know, previously very good at. Um, I like to think I'm a pretty decent software developer. I don't think I'm ever the best in the room, but I think I'm, I'm right up there. Um, and every time you step up from a senior to a manager to a director, you get a little bit further and further away from the code. Um, interestingly, my, my manager at the time when I was first promoted to a development manager uh, told me, Mike, I'm really sorry, but Gitol wants to know if you want to be a manager. And I was like, that, you don't have to apologize for that. That sounds amazing. That sounds great. It's like the next step in my path. Um, I didn't really fully understand what he meant until uh, later. Um, and uh, I'll go, go over that in a little bit, but um, I definitely started to feel the, a little bit of an atrophy of my skills. I started to kind of fall behind, uh, in particular in front-end development, which is my particular favorite area of development, and JavaScript and front-end development move at a lightning pace. Um, so I was interested in something a little bit different. So I went to Beable, which is same, same, but different. Uh, this was started by the founder of Achieve 3000. It was another literacy solution, uh, so same exact purpose, uh, but it was a startup. Uh, by and large, uh, a lot of the same people, a lot of the same vibe, uh, but a very, very different position for the company. Uh, it was a lot of fun, a uh, very large period of growth. Um, nothing I can really say particularly bad about it. I had a ton of fun there. Uh, but near the end, uh, I had somebody reach out from a network and ask if I was interested in a uh, director position. And that's where I am today, uh, starting as a director of engineering and winding up here presenting to you today. 
Um, again, nothing says contributing to society like ads and emails. Um, I, I mentioned this before, purpose is, is really, really important. Um, and over the last two years, I have found a lot of purpose. Uh, when I first started, I was told the company was 15 engineers, and they were looking to grow. And they were serious, because I had never had the opportunity to start an interview by saying, Hi, my name is Michael Marcos. Thank you for coming here. I've been with the company for six hours, and uh, it, that's it. That's all I've got. Uh, I interviewed uh, the first candidate for our team on the very first day that I started, which was marginally terrifying. <clears throat> and I do really, really well with pressure. Uh, I didn't actually run off, off camera that time, though, so that, that worked out pretty well. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it is a great company. Uh, it's a lot of fun. They are in New York. Um, I have had a lot of challenges to face. Uh, it seems like every single quarter uh, there is a new challenge to address. Uh, recently we had our management layer uh, go from three people to one. Uh, one manager left to go to a different group and I was working with another to see if he really wanted to be a people manager or if he just wanted to be a rockstar software developer. And he was a rockstar software developer. Uh, this is uh, Chiago about to be, that's a, the sorting hat uh, on a TV. So he, he's about to have his house picked for him. <clears throat> But this is the this is a director's schedule. This is a, probably a manager's schedule too, um, and this is one of the things that my old manager kind of warned me about. He saw how much I enjoyed coding. He saw how much I really got, how much value I got personally out of that, um, and he saw my role about to change into something that resembles this. Um, for a developer schedule, you're looking at like two meetings a day. Uh, for my schedule, I'm lucky to have two meetings per time slot. Uh, is you, you can see there's actually a, a nice lunch block here that I have Orlando insisted. That's my boss. He told me to, to block lunch. And I have one day that I actually have the lunch block uh, that actually worked. Uh, otherwise, it's like trying to stop a tsunami by just like holding your arms out. It's completely ineffective. Um, but it's a different role. Um, and this is something that I've enjoyed. Uh, this is something that I've enjoyed developing my skills in. Um, but it's something that I think anybody uh, in the software development field, uh, especially when you're just starting out, you kind of view it as like the natural progression. Um, maybe a little bit less so now with like titles, uh, like more advanced uh, software development titles uh, becoming more mainstream and widespread. Um, but historically, you know, you work as a software developer, you get promoted to a senior, maybe eventually you get to be a manager, maybe you eventually become a director, maybe eventually you become a CTO or a VP or something like that. But uh, in more and more recent days, uh, titles where you can continue to advance in your technical skills have become available. Uh, at Live Intent, we spent a fair amount of time really uh, fine tuning what our promotion path is. We have a management and a technical uh, promotion path, and this is something that we think is really important um, to make sure that you don't really feel stuck when you're a senior. Like nowhere to go outside of a job that effectively doesn't look like your old job that you really enjoyed. Um, <clears throat> but this is a this is a picture of the people that I work with, and amazingly enough, we're probably drinking exactly the same amount as we were in the beer pong picture from before. But it looks a lot classier. <clears throat> uh, also, axe throwing. Uh, that is one of my uh, it's my boss who is throwing the axe. Thankfully, not at me, and uh, one of my direct reports. Uh, there, there are a few things that I've learned uh, in, in my career and, and the moves or risks that I've taken um, that I think are really important. Uh, I don't know how applicable they will be to you all. I've found them to be important, and I would like, or I'd urge you to all try and find out the things that are important to you. Um, these are things that have not only helped me, but have helped the people uh, that I've worked with and for. I wrote this at 1 a.m. last night. <laughs> And it made a lot more sense then, <clears throat> but uh, you know, you, you've probably heard the expression, if you love the thing you do, you'll never work a day in your life, right? I think that is complete and total nonsense. Uh, I love the stuff I do, and I still feel like I work every single day of my life. I'm a director, I work weekends, I'm, I have a three-year-old, I work weekends. Um, but one of the things that I've found over the last 12 or so years is that when you're in the middle of one of those scrambles, when you're at a company that's hectic or when you're in a period where you have an urgent delivery coming up, loving what you do and liking the stuff that you do, liking the tools that you use, liking the, um, the people that you work with, it makes those kind of periods of intense stress and pressure 
bearable. And sometimes even better than bearable, you can leave them with a feeling of uh, being rewarded or, or, or feeling accomplished. Some of those very early jobs, uh, like Refer Local, um, those involved like working till 1 a.m. to get a feature out the door because it was promised to a customer before it was run by engineering to figure out if it was something that was even remotely deliverable on time. Um, that happened a lot and it was stressful. Uh, you will find that in your professional careers. There are going to be times that there is an incredible amount of stress that's put on you. But finding the thing that you really love, the specialty that you really enjoy, the craft that you really want to get better at, that makes those scrambles a lot better. And if you like the eggs, the scrambles are more fun. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> communication is critical, and I'm going to just lump this into relationships or everything. Uh, this I learned at Achieve 3000. Uh, being able to communicate well is something that I, I can't speak to everybody in the room because you are from a very diverse uh, set of majors and disciplines. Um, but software engineers typically have struggled with building relationships as well as communicating. Uh, these two things are absolutely critical for success in any field, obviously. Um, but it's something that I've found I've had to work on actively to get better at. Um, being able to communicate cross-functionally with product people that are trying to figure out how, what they actually want to build. Um, with project managers who are trying to figure out when you're actually going to build it. With your boss who also wants to know when you're going to build it. Uh, this is an incredibly, incredibly important skill set to have and develop as a software engineer. Um, and building those relationships, instilling trust and, and building that trust with the people that you work with uh, makes everything significantly easier. Uh, purpose is really powerful. Uh, I've found uh, various different uh, purposes uh, in my career. I spent the majority of it in ed tech, uh, working on solutions to, what's the Zoolander quote, to teach kids to read better and do stuff, whatever that quote is. Um, I found really, really good product purpose there. Like what I was doing made a difference in the world. Um, I found purpose in my impact in the things that are around me. Uh, when I was a manager, when I was a director, the way that I was able to affect change on a slightly larger uh, scale. Uh, that was really important to me at the time. I wanted to develop certain skills, so I took roles that really suited what I wanted as a purpose in life. Uh, move fast, fail fast, learn fast is the move fast, break things uh, uh, expression. We talked about that a little bit. Um, I think this is really important. If you're afraid of breaking things, you're not going to learn, uh, at least in my experience. It's not a globally applicable law. Um, but this is how I've learned uh, absolutely for sure. Um, by breaking production, I have uh, taught myself pretty important lessons that did not go away really, really well, or really quickly. And uh, passion is pertinent. 1 a.m. again. Uh, I didn't want to use the word powerful again. Um, my purposes uh, have all been really fueled by what I was passionate about. Uh, so whether it's personal growth, whether it's uh, the ability to affect change at a bigger scale, whether it's um, being able to feel like the work that I'm doing is contributing to something better and bigger in society, um, having passion uh, is really, really pertinent. Um, that's about it. That's, that's where I am today. Um, I know I didn't really hop into too much technical things, which I think is pretty good considering the the group here. Uh, but do you all have any questions for me? On your schedule for Friday at the end, is it bug mania? Bug, <laughs> bug management 2.0, I think, is the, the meeting. Bug management, it got truncated. Is it, yeah. Is it actually as small of a block or did it just go on and on and on? No, it's, it's a half hour block, but the, the text didn't fit in because to look at my whole schedule, I have to zoom that far out to see the insanity. Yeah. While we're on that slide, yes. what is planned the Bazinga? In the <laughs> yeah, uh, all our teams are named after TV shows. Uh, so we have Bazinga, which, um, sorry, Ray, but I don't like the name because uh, I don't like the show. Also, sorry to whoever I may offend. Um, Heisenberg, uh, which was originally named after the uncertainty principle, but we turned it into after Breaking Bad. Um, Powerpuff Girls. Yes, we have, we have Powerpuff Girls, uh, PPG. Uh, we actually have uh, sub-teams that are named after the individual Powerpuff Girls, and they actually named their sprints after uh, villains in the show, which is fun and cute. So I have a question about internships, as yes. some of us are getting you know, further along in our um, years or majors. So how did you secure that first internship? And then, I mean, I know it's been a while to ask, like, what are the best internship answers and stuff like that? But what would you look for in students that you would be hiring for your company or your startup that would be coming to you for internship, internships, I guess? Sure. Uh, I don't know how to give the best internship answers without questions. That's an important first part. But um, 
Uh, as far as how I got the, the Eat Mix internship, uh, that was set up, I, I think at that point, it was Fred just emailing the whole group of IST students saying, hey, there is an internship available, go and apply if you want. Um, as far as what I look for in every candidate is a spark of excitement. Um, I, I, I don't want to undervalue at all uh, formal education uh, in IST. I think it's really, really important to have that fo uh, foundation. But the vast majority of things that I do on the regular are self-taught. And if uh, the people that are going to be on my team are not willing and excited to uh, participate in that self-learning process, um, it's typically not someone that I think is going to work out uh, particularly well. I think that would apply for internships as well, particularly when you're coming in with uh, an ab abundance of lack of knowledge. That's a weird way to say that, but uh, if you don't really have a, a lot of uh, real world experience or practical experience, demonstrating that you're excited about learning is probably going to be one of the best ways to, to secure an internship. Have you compiled accept the internship from someone who hasn't gone to college? Oh yeah, yeah. We've, we've, uh, my VP hasn't gone to college. My, my boss hasn't gone to college. Um, I actually, so uh, this is interesting. Uh, most of the uh, job recs that we've posted have been, uh, you know, requirement of a CS degree or equivalent or relevant work experience. Do you have any, like, life quotes that you live by to kind of get you through those challenging times? Passion is pertinent. It's <laughs> definitely, definitely my life quote. <laughs> Scrambles are good if you like Scrambles eggs. Scrambles are good if you like eggs. Yeah, I'm, that's 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 a knowledge bomb right there. Um, I don't really. Uh, I typically work uh, the, the way that I work uh, in like stressful periods is uh, what's that uh, the the method is the the Pomodoro method where you have like intense focus and then five minute break. I do that except like for an hour and then I go angrily rant to someone like for like 10, 15 minutes and then I come back and just keep working. Uh, that's by and large my process for when things get stressful. Um, you know, I, I did say it before, relationships are, are really important, they're essential. Um, and I found that the expression misery loves company is really very true. Uh, and being able to kind of be in the trenches with somebody else when you're going through uh, a really, really bad period is very important. That, that first, uh, uh, th that position at Refer Local, uh, me and, and my co-lead were doing the same thing at the same time and we were pretty much in that pattern of like da, 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 da. this is the worst why are we still here so commiseration yes when did you realize that IST was your intended field of study I'm actually curious to ask uh, frankly when did you realize so when did I realize that it was what I wanted to do yeah uh so when I first got here, I, I mentioned that Doc Deb came up and like excitedly, uh, you know, told me all about it. I wasn't sure it was for me at that point. Um, I knew I liked software development. I, I knew I liked playing around with coding things. Um, I just really didn't have any idea like what specifically I wanted to do when I was all grown up. Yes. Still don't entirely do. I might want to be a race car driver. Um, but I think after my first year uh, here, uh, when I saw, I think at that point, IST looked a little bit different. Uh, it was design and development and integration were the two focuses that were offered here. And I uh, was looking at the courses and I was like, design and development, 100%. And I just, I started really focusing in on that. So how were you able to uh, kind of have those goals of growth, like for CTO and, and continue that even when you transferred over? You wanted to actually be more in the company than just a face. So, so how did you kind of move through that even though you were moving jobs? So one interesting thing about the software development world, and, and I think this is different for like different classes of companies, right? Um, going to a different company is a really, really effective way to move up. Um, I don't know exactly how applicable that is in a lot of other fields. Um, but it's kind of sort of like insurance. Uh, you know, you have an insurance policy for two years and then they jack up the rates and you're like, well, can you bring them down? They say no. And you say, I'm going somewhere else and I'll get a better deal. Um, so a lot of the times uh, I was able to maintain that trajectory, not just in salary, but in, in title um, by taking the lessons that I had learned and, and using those really well in interviews to make sure I was able to demonstrate that I was as good as the position required. Did you, yeah, did you move away and then move back? Uh, so I'm actually originally from New Jersey. Um, that's usually when people start. 
booing uh, a lot. Um, but Tolerance here. Excellent. Excellent. Um, uh, but uh, I, I lived uh, in Bethlehem when I was at Lehigh. I uh, moved out here. Uh, I actually lived down at the apartments down at the bottom of the street before there were dorms here. Um, <clears throat> And uh, I moved away to Philly, and then Wilkesbury was new to me, but it's kind of sort of like the same area as Dunmore, except there's like that weird Luzerne Lackawanna line that you don't really cross unless you have to for some reason. Um, but as far as where I live, I do love the area. Um, uh, I, I like, I think the people are nicer here than in New Jersey, and 100% nicer than New York uh, City in particular. Um, but also in, in my particular position, I've been able to work at companies in Chicago and New York, which are very high cost of living areas, which also have uh, higher salaries and been able to live in effectively a medium cost of living area. Um, so that to me has been uh, a real boon. Uh, and you know, back in 2012, remote work was somewhat rare. Um, I... Uh, a few of the companies that I worked for, uh, I was the first or one of the first people to start remote. Um, but now it's significantly more common. So I like how you shared your um, experience switching from job to job. Mm -hmm. When, so it's something we don't really have a lot of experience with though or some anxiety about. When you work for a job, do you hope or think that it's something you'll stay at for a long time or forever? Uh, one of my managers at uh, Sparts, uh, the, the people there were fantastic. Uh, they really were. Uh, he had a fantastic attitude. His attitude was, my job as a manager is to make sure that you leave here a better developer than when you joined. Kind of like the Boy Scout motto, except with people. Um, and I personally, in, in my particular experience of like mid-sized companies, turnover is a, a real thing. I don't expect to be retiring with anyone at Live Intent. Uh, I don't think I ever really expected to be retiring with anybody at any of my former positions. Um, maybe refer local, but that's mostly from naivete and just thinking I was going to be, you know, buying my own small, like, private island after that went uh, big. Um, but... Uh, no, again, and it, this is very different for like big companies, right? If you are uh, at a company that is very large um, and you find appropriate opportunities, there is a reasonably good chance that even if you are interested in different things, you can hop between different positions at that company. From sure an interviewing standpoint, like if you did a research project, like a big thing. Absolutely, especially for an internship, especially when you're coming in without any like relevant experience. Uh, showing that you're doing more than just you know the classroom work that's expected, uh, even if the research project is part of like classroom requirements, absolutely uh, an important thing. Yeah.